that when it comes to preaching, I don't know much of what I'm doing. Just to be honest with you. Uh, Basil Overton, one of my heroes, he's from Kentucky, has always said that the best thing about what we're doing is we don't know what we're doing. We don't know who's in the audience. We don't know who's going to be impacted or changed or life or what's going on in their life on that specific occasion and how what you say may affect them. But I've studied this thing called preaching for for over 50 years now. I, I've been a student of, of preaching. I want to be the very best that I can be. I've always tried to, to, to improve and to get, to get better. Tonight we're going to move forward a little bit. These things called grandchildren are great. They're my five grandchildren. And you know, we like to say things about, about children. That would be uh, Lucas in the back and Mamie Grace to his left, to his right, as y'all are looking. Holly that's kind of stooped down there a little bit, holding Addie, who is a Tasmanian devil, and then little Mia, who is the littlest of them all, but she is full of spunk and energy. And uh, that's Mia on her second birthday. I don't know why she has four candles on her cake, but that's her on her whatever she's got. But her second birthday was two days ago. She turned two. And she is so very joyful. And you know, we say things about children. We say things like, you're growing up way too fast. You ever had that said to you, any of the kids here? You grow up way too fast. Yeah, I see you nodding. Or, or we say things like this. Oh, I just wish they could stay little forever. We don't mean that. I mean, there are stories of like this little fellow that's 30 years old. Got the mind of a nine-month-old. And it's actually painful and, and heart-rending. And as, as sweet as children that have the disabilities that cause them not to grow or not to develop mentally as others would, as loved and as special as they are and the, the joy they bring into our lives, we all know that that's not what we want for our children. We don't want their growth stunted. We don't want them to be mentally a nine-month-old or a two-year-old for the rest of their life. That's not what any parent would want. As tragic as it is, that's what we want. But we're a culture that has so embraced the mantra that youth is everything. We have a song series, an advertising series, Never Grow Up. And the, the sad thing is that there are some Christians who have that stunning growth in their life. We, we don't call them out. You, you can't easily identify them by speaking to them for a couple of moments, or you can't, you can't uh, point them out by their size or anything. But there are some Christians who never grow up. Welcome to the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bible tonight, we're going to study from the book of Hebrews tonight. And I invite you to open to chapter 5. A little bit of background before we get in the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Many people believe that Hebrews was written to second or third generation Christians. Now I want to ask you tonight, by show of hands, if you're willing to play along with me on this, how many of you grew up in the church. I mean, how many of you grew up in the church? Your parents, your grandparents were Christians. How many of you are second or third generation Christians? Your grandparents were Christians. How many of you are fourth generation Christians? I am, my, my son is a seventh generation preacher. Poor fella. I mean, the greatest blessing in my life outside of the Lord is I have a mom and dad who love the Lord. We grew up in the church. I mean, I felt like at times we lived there. I mean, you know, our breakfast was the communion bread, and we bathed in the baptistry, it seemed like, at times. We were there all the time. I mean, that was our life. That was what we did. When we wanted entertainment for us was a gospel meeting on a Friday night, you know, and maybe a piece of strawberry cake from, strawberry pie from Shoney's after. That was our entertainment. I mean, I, I don't know it. The greatest blessing. I would take nothing for it. But, have you ever thought there are some disadvantages of growing up in the church? I, I, I don't speak in any way bad toward parents, grandparents, people who love the Lord and train me. But there are some disadvantages. One is, have you ever seen someone that did not grow up in the church when they first embrace faith, when they first become Christians, and the vitality and the energy they have for the Lord? 
I mean, they're on fire. And sometimes those who grow up in the church, we kind of take it for granted. I, I was born on a Monday, and I was in church on a Wednesday. I've gone to church all my life. I have no great backstory. We had this guy who used to come through Birmingham named Roger Russell, and he'd stand up and preach, and he'd tell about his life in drugs before he became a Christian. We had a guy named Charles that had been an alcoholic, and he talked about how the Lord found him in that, and he was led to the Lord, and he put that aside. And the stories would amaze and fascinate me. And I remember when I was in fifth grade thinking, I'm wasting my life. I need to get busy preaching. But I always thought, I never have any story. I never know, knew the, the lostness of lostness. I'm not saying I was lost. I'm not saying I was not a sinner. I was. The Lord did not pick me up out of the slime and put me into his family. He cleaned me off and my sins are as bad as anyone else's. But there is a difference, isn't there? And sometimes when we grow up in the church, we don't feel that. And these second and third generation Christians are now looking back to their parents and their grandparents at the beginning of the thing. Maybe we should go back. The writer said, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation as it was first declared by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard? So you see, the idea is we didn't hear initially, we heard from someone else. They're second generation, maybe third generation Christians and, and the, the, the spark of Christianity is worn off. They're facing persecution. Chapter 10 will say they've not yet resisted to blood, but the indication is there is coming. Greater persecution is coming. You're going to be tempted to turn back, and you might be wanting to turn back, and you might be wanting to go back to the easy life, so to speak, of Judaism and neglect Christianity. And he says, don't do it. And he gets to chapter 5. We read along with me, starting in verse 12. For though, for, through though this time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, that which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food belongs to the mature, to those who by reason of use or by practice have had their senses discern, uh, trained so that they may be able to discern what is good and what is evil. Chapter 6, therefore he says, leaving the discussion of the elementary, the principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. The writer of Hebrews says to them, grow up. That's the summation of chapter 5, verse 10, through chapter 6, verse 2. He says, grow up. He says, you've been Christians long enough. It's time for you to get off the infamil of the Word and get to the meat of the Word. It's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to move on. And I say to you tonight, though I don't have the influence to say it to you, some of you need to grow up. I don't know you. I don't know who it is in this audience I'm speaking to tonight. But I imagine that some of you in this audience are still extremely immature spiritually. And we can't tell it by looking at you. You may have gray hair or no hair at all. You may look old. You may look mature. But some of you aren't. And none of your elders have told me that. I've not asked one of them this. I didn't say, all right, who am I preaching to tonight? But all I could, they could identify you. And they would do it painfully, not joyfully, and not vengefully, not spitefully. But they know, are you still immature as a Christian? And my question to you tonight is, are you listening? Do you want to be better? Do you want your spiritual life to matter more? Do you want to grow in the faith? Do you want to be a spiritual giant or do you want to spend the rest of your life as a pygmy? And are you willing to invest in your own life's spiritual maturity? Are you willing to grow? Are you happy being immature? Are you happy being an infant? Are you happy never being able to move on spiritually in your life? 
We'll start tonight by talking about the difference between milk and meat. Milk and, as NIV says, solid food. The King James, ESV, other translations say meat. What's the difference between milk and meat? Four things real quick. Number one, milk is what you get from others. It's what you get from others. I mean, some of us have what the writer will call dull minds. In fact, that's verse 11. Concerning the word of whom we have much to speak, of hard to explain, to say, to a hard, uh, of hard explanation to say, since you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing is what it is when you've just eaten supper and the heat is high in the auditorium. I can't hear too well because I'm trying to sleep, okay? Dull of hearing. You're still drinking milk. Oh, Gene, I mentioned him last night. When they hired me at this church, I was 26 years old. I was too young to be hired at that church. Shouldn't have been in that pulpit. Gene objected to the elders hiring me. And I remember Gene coming up to me one time and he said, Listen, if I need you to help me grow spiritually, something's wrong with me. I've been a Christian, he said, for 40 years. And if somebody says to feed me, there's something wrong with me, not wrong with you. And I think he's right. If all your spiritual nourishment comes from Brother Steve's outstanding lessons, then you're in trouble spiritually. It's not a criticism of Steve, it's a criticism of you. If you leave church and say, he just doesn't feed me, well, guess what? You just admitted you're a baby. You've got to have somebody feed you. I mean, think about it. That's what babies do, isn't it? Somebody has to get their milk for them. They don't go to the refrigerator and say, I think I have a glass of milk. Number two, milk is already learned. Meat is breaking new ground. He says, let us go on past the elementary stage. They told me I could do this. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. Whoop, it. It worked for a second. Past, it's not going to work. Past elementary stage in the teaching and doctrine of Christ, advancing steadily toward the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Past elementary. Some of you need to graduate from the primary classes in church and go to the high school classes and the college classes and the adult classes, but you're stuck in the primary classes. That doesn't mean that milk's not important. My friend Lonnie Jones, who several of you will know from CYC and other events, when I am involved with CYC, I always write the speakers and say, tell me your favorite stuff to snack on, and I put a little snack basket to bed for them, have a ready for them in their hotel room when they get there. And Lonnie wrote me and said, I like purity chocolate milk. So I bought him four quarts of purity chocolate milk. (laughs) He was kind of proud of that. This doesn't mean you don't love the elementary principles. I still love the doctrine of Christ. I still love the elementary principles. But it it doesn't mean you forget them. But it means you've moved on to even more in your life spiritually. Number three, milk is that Christ died for me. Meat is that I die for Christ. Paul said, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Of course, you know Galatians how it says in chapter 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. You know the song, well, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We're to take up our cross, as Jesus said, as Luke recorded, daily and follow him. Christ, meat is, I want to live my life for him. I've died to self. I've realized I don't know how to direct my own life. I realize I'll make a million mistakes and I can't depend on me, so I must die daily to self and live for Christ. Number four, with milk only, you can get a bad attitude. One of the reasons the writer is saying you need to move on from milk to meat is if all you do is milk the rest of your life, you're not going to have any strength. Milk can sour. I did not know you could buy sour milk until today, but apparently you can. I don't know how well this product sells, but I'm not buying any, okay? 
Milk can sour. Anytime you see a sour Christian, mad about everything, ready to fight at the drop of a hat, always in an argumentative stage, unhappy, continual about something. You, they believe church is something you go to fight about. It means they are immature spiritual and they are still on milk. I want to tell you though tonight, and you need to hear this, that God is not done with you yet. We could all wear little signs around our neck that say under construction, God will continue to work with you and can continue to grow you and mature you. And if you stopped growing when you walked out of the baptistry and for 40 years you've not grown spiritually, he'll still take you under his wings. And he'll still grow you. He'll still make you better than you were. It's written this way. Walk in a, worthy, a manner worthy of the Lord that is pleasing to him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. If you're sitting here and breathing, there's still time for you to grow spiritually. All right, so <clears throat> that was introduction. So what we're going to look at now is six principles about milk and meat. You ready? Here they are. Simple things. Number one, milk is first principles. Milk is that Jesus loves me. Milk is the steps of salvation. Milk is the bread and the juice. Meat is that I love Jesus. Meat is the depth of the meaning of Christ's sacrifice that is, I'm reminded of through the communion every week. Meat is the commitment involved in dying to self when I'm baptized into Christ. Milk and meat. This is my grandson, Lucas. I put this up here for a reason to illustrate. That's his sister, Holly, with him in the picture. It's odd growing up in a family with preachers and generations of preachers. So uh, Philip and Laura, my son and daughter-in-law, called me and said, called Melanie and said, we're going out on a date. Would you mind coming and watch the grandchildren? So we said, we'll get back with you on that. <laughs> no, he said, of course we will. What time you want us there? So we got to their house, and Laura, Philip Lucas, at that age, was, was four years old. We got to their house, and Laura's giving Melanie instructions on eating and bedtime and all that stuff that we're going to ignore when they're gone. And then she gets down on her knee in front of four-year-old Lucas, and she says to him, Now, Lucas, while we're gone, don't baptize your sister. <laughs> so Lucas has seen his dad, who baptizes a lot of people, baptize people, and what he said, and he could imitate it at four years old. At four years old, he would put his hand up and he would say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. And then in his bathtub, he baptized his Sesame Street characters. All except for Count. <laughs> Apparently understood that text about baptism of the dead that we don't understand, okay? So he had to figure it out long before us. But. Milk is, is knowing the pattern it's knowing the way. It's being at age four to be able to repeat what you've heard three times a week at least every service. I was six years old the first time I went to my dad and said, Dad, I want to be baptized. And you know what he said? There's that, thing, there's that sound again. It means nothing apparently. Who is that for? For classes. Okay. So he said... You're too young. Turn seven. I went to dad. I said, dad, I'm ready to be baptized. I'm seven now. He said, you're too young. In fact, your brother's not a Christian yet. You're younger than he is. That year I spent being a great evangelist. I convinced my brother to be baptized. <laughs> he was my first convert I worked with. My eighth birthday was on a Sunday. 
I went in and saw Dad. I said, Dad, woke him up. I said, Dad, 6 a.m., Dad, I'm, I'm ready to be baptized. I turn eight today. You know what he said? You're too young. That afternoon, I called a meeting of Herman King and C.C. C. Taggart and Brother McDade, the three elders of the church, and I said, I want to be baptized. My dad won't baptize me. <laughs> I was baptized later that day. Dad wanted to keep his job, I guess. You know, we can understand intellectually, but do we understand spiritually? Do we know the meaning behind the meeting? Have we dug deep? Have we gone from milk to meat in our life? Number two, properly growing babies want to eat off the table. You do Thanksgiving around here? You have a kitty table? Now the desire is to get away from that table and get to the big folks' table. Properly growing babies want to eat off the table. As a child grows, they want meat. They want to eat something substantial. They want to move on from the milk to something else. I enjoyed steak tonight with the gardeners. They took me to Outback. Guess what? I didn't order a platter of milk. I ordered steak. Now, if you're a vegan, I'm sorry. I apologize to you. This lesson may offend you. It's not designed to. He's not saying you've got to eat meat to be a Christian. He's talking about you've got to eat spiritually meat to be a Christian. Number three, there are some keys to spotting milk drinkers. There are several of them. First one is they seek only to serve themselves. Babies never think about inconveniencing others. I mean, you know, baby never says, oh, mom's busy right now. I'll just wait patiently for my diaper to be changed, right? If you're a spiritual baby, you only think of yourself, your way. I've got to have my way. If I don't get my way, I'm going to take my collection. I'm going to go to another congregation. If I don't get my way, I'm going to pout. If I don't get my way, I'm going to be angry. If I'm going to, I'm going to get my way regardless. They think only of themselves. Number two, they see more bad in God's kingdom than good. Again, the writer says, these have had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They know the difference between what is good and what is evil. Babies don't know the difference between good and evil, right? And they don't know that there's some ground in between good and evil. There may be something that's not good, but it's not evil either. Babies can't see the difference between good and evil. They think everything is black and white, and they can only see their way. And they demand their way. And it may be a matter of opinion, but they're going to get their opinion, and it's going to be said. Spiritual babies see a problem, and they think everything is bad. I don't know how many high school students are in here tonight, but there are several of you. And I'm honored that you're here tonight. I'm glad you're here. Whether you made the decision, your parents made the decision for you, I'm still glad you're here. But most of you are probably going to go off to college. And when you go to college, if you go to state school or many of even our schools, there are going to be people in those schools that have an agenda in their mind in which they're going to try to dismantle your faith. And they'll say things like, we know the church is full of hypocrites. Guess what? There are a lot of hypocrites in the church. Not as many as are at the local bar, but there are a lot of hypocrites in the church. But a baby can't say, all right, this person is a hypocrite, and they're a hypocrite in every way, but that doesn't mean the church is bad. That means he's bad. They can't see some matter going bad in the church, a congregation that's struggling over something, and say, well, that's sad that congregation is struggling. They see it and say, the church of Christ is not good. And they jettison it and leave all their beliefs and their spiritual heritage, and they try to find something that they think is better. And oftentimes, most often, most often, they leave the Lord's kingdom and go somewhere that is not his kingdom. This is a problem deacons have often. I doubt you have it here, but I've seen it in many places. Where a man is involved heavily in the work of the church, and the elders and the congregation decides they make him a deacon, and he goes from being a general volunteer in the church, somebody who did a lot of things, everybody pat him on the back, and we appreciate your service, we're thankful for you. And the moment he got that title, deacon, people started coming to him with problems. And within six months or a year, he thinks all we got is problems. 
And there are also problems existed before. You go from being a person involved to a person that is in leadership, and suddenly you become part of that problem. Deacons who are immature spiritually, elders too, it can happen with them too, they can't handle that. They can't say, all right, well, this is good and this is evil. They see the evil and they say it's all evil. And they start checking out and getting angry about everything and make, becoming one people agendas. Number three, you can spot a spiritually immature person because they try to get by with doing as little as possible. I think the song was written in 1978, may have been 72. Make me a servant, Lord. Make me like you, for you are a servant. Make me one too. Babies have to be served. They don't change their own diaper. They don't prepare their own meals. They don't fix their own bottles. They don't open the door for themselves. Not expected to, they're babies. If you come to church every week and you sit and all you expect to do is serve and you are not a servant, then you are a spiritual baby and you need to repent and you need to get busy serving. God, sir, God saved no one to sit. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that he has put each one in the body just as it has pleased him. And when you are not serving as a Christian, you are handicapping the body of Christ. Now, a baby will hear that and get mad at the preacher and turn off the hearing aid, don't do that. I'm not here to make you angry. I'm here to help you get better. You, want, you said earlier you wanted to be better. Do you really? You know, one of the challenges I'm seeing from the pandemic, it's the first time I've used that word, I think, since I've been here. The challenge I'm seeing from it in a lot of churches is some people are coming back, but some of the very people coming back refuse to get involved in the work of the Lord like they were before. And you know what you're doing? If you're not, you're handicapping the body of Christ. If you're still breathing, you better be a servant if you're blown to God. And if you're still breathing and you're not a servant, you don't belong to God. You belong to someone else. God's people are servants because Christ was a servant, and our mission on earth is to become like him. Number four, isn't it appropriate here? <laughs> Those who are spiritually mature wear their feelings on their sleeve. They get hurt real easy. They can't handle difficult, challenging things. Somebody challenges them anyway, and they get all bowed up and bent out of shape. You know this because you have to walk on eggshells egg around them. The sad thing is, I don't know that people who other people have to walk around eggshells around know that they have to walk around eggshells around them. That was a well-constructed sentence, wasn't it? <laughs> but if people are always gingerly talking to you and can't tell you the truth about anything without you getting your feelings hurt, or you're getting angry, or you pitching a fit, then you're probably spiritually immature. Next, they don't spend time in fervent prayer. You can gauge the spirituality of a person by the power of their prayer life. Number six, they're self-righteous. Paul wrote it this way, that I want to be found in Christ, found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God the Father by faith, from God by faith. You see, spiritually immature people think that any righteousness they have, they acclaimed on their own. I was baptized on August the 27th, 1971, and that is my spiritual birthday, and I owe everything to it, and that's my claim to righteousness. It is not. I was made righteous in God's eyes that day, but I did not become a righteous person in my own self that day. I'm only righteous through Him. But somebody who thinks that was the totality of their faith, they're still immature spiritually. That's called self-righteousness. Number seven, spiritually mature people don't enjoy Bible study. They don't. Uh, you'll hear a cry from them. We need more entertainment. We need more drama. We need more of this. We need more of that. Less studying of the Word of God. Less preaching. Less teaching. And that's a sign of a spiritually mature person. Entertain me. I do things. See, I don't know what you do, but I do things. I wear these weird socks. I don't do them because I love weird socks. I do them because I'm colorblind. I know that they're going to match when I put them on. But there's another reason I do them because some people may listen to me, might, might not listen to me if I didn't do something weird every now and then. 
That's the sign of spiritual maturity. If that's all you can do is listen to someone when they're interesting, what you're going to do when you, at some point in your life, you're going to go to the place that you think is most entertaining, regardless of what the teaching is. Spiritual mature people say, I want to hear the Word of God. Number eight, spiritually immature people cannot readily discuss anything spiritually. And number nine, they would rather argue than submit to the word of God. They will fight at the drop of a hat and they'll provide the hat. They believe Christianity is all about fighting and winning arguments. Number four, you may not be aware of, but Christ had to be matured. The Bible says still here in the book of Hebrews, in fact, our chapter, chapter five, just three verses before or four verses before our text, although he's a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. I do not understand that. I could give you an answer that I've run across that I think works, but I can't explain that verse in its totality to you. But even if Christ had if Christ had to be matured, then it should not bother me that I have to keep maturing throughout my life. Number five, I want to tell you tonight that growth hurts. Growth hurts. It is painful to grow. It means change in your life. It means change in your heart. It means you've got to do some things different. It means sometimes you have to stretch yourself. It means sometimes you have to study verses that aren't the same verse over and over again that's your go-to verse. It means you're going to grow, and growth is often painful. Number six, I want to talk to you as we close tonight. About the outcome of growth. Watch the text. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lights be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with, thanks, with thankfulness. You see, you can look at almost any book in the New Testament, and you'll find words that talk about the benefits of growth. Yes, number five, growth is painful. But number six, there are such great things that happen. When you grow and your roots grow deep, you can't be moved. Remember that verse you learned as a child? Psalm chapter one, he's planted by the water of life. His roots have grown deep. He can't be moved. Let your roots in Christ be deep. Galatians talks about how we need to avoid the root of bitterness in our lives. There are too many people in this culture we live in who have let the root of bitterness grow in their life, but they've not grown the root of faith in their life. And so when trouble comes, they get angry rather than dealing with their anger by saying, how would God handle this situation? Peter wrote it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's talking about growth. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and, and deceit and hypocrisy and, and envy and slander of every kind. Now watch it, go back to Hebrews, like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk that you may grow by it unto salvation. And then here's the result, now you have tasted that the Lord is good. Paul said to Timothy, be diligent in these matters, give yourselves wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. I love this idea of growing, it goes on and on in the text. We could talk about it all night long. But tonight I want to challenge you in your life. I want to challenge you this evening to make a decision that you're going to make a commitment in your life. Uh, The hardest thing is to see growth in our life. So I want to tell you tonight, the way you grow is you spend time in the Word of God. It is a source of our faith. Any faith that is accurate in our life will come directly or indirectly from the Word of God. If you're not growing spiritually, it's because you're not spending time in the Word of God. It also comes by spending time with other people who are rooted in the Word of God. Looking up to them. Who are your spiritual mentors? Who are your heroes? Are the people of great faith? People who love the Word of God and respect it? Are there people that you just enjoy listening to or just enjoy being around? I want to challenge you tonight to commit in your life that if you've been a baby, don't rail up tonight and get all upset. Well, he called me out tonight. I don't know who I called out tonight, so you can't be upset about that. Only you know and God knows. What I want to tell you tonight is it's time for you to grow up. So I want you to commit tonight that I am going to start where I am and I'm going to keep growing in my life. I'm going to not stop in this thing 
I'm going to keep maturing in my spirituality. I'm going to grow closer to the Lord and more like the Lord. And tonight it may be that there are some in here who have not been born yet. So how's that? Or they've not experienced a new birth. They've not been baptized into Christ. They've not come to him, turning from sin. They've not confessed, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. They're kind of stuck there. And it's possible, no one has told me this, but it's possible, it's even probable. I've been to many places. It's very possible that there's somebody in here tonight that you're not a Christian, you know you're not a Christian, you've been coming to church for years and years, and everybody here is praying for you. You're still at the starting line. And I don't know what excuse you've had or what reason you've had, but I want to tell you tonight, tonight is your night. It's your time to make that decision. I'm going to put Christ on in baptism. I'm going to get rid of whatever phobia is, whatever fear it is, whatever concern it is, whatever objection there is, and I'm going to do what the Lord said. I'm going to be baptized. Tonight, if you're his child and you've stopped living for him, it's time for you to come home. It may be time for you to go home tonight and sit down with your family and say, listen, we've, we've done enough gossiping and running down the Lord and his people, and I've done enough of this immature stuff. I need to start growing, and I need you to help me. It takes a real leader to do that. And maybe you need to go to some friends that you have a little group, and you, you badmouth everything that happens in the church, and you know your spirits are mature. You know it's not right, but it's fun to do it, and it may be time for you to say, listen, we've got to stop doing this. It's not helping the kingdom any at all. I'm going to grow up. I need you to as well. Will you help me? Will you forgive me? I I don't know. I don't know who's in this room. But I challenge you tonight to make that decision. You said you want to grow. You said you want to be better. Do something about it.